The takeover by these types of fundamentalist settler movement is eroding democracy in Israel. It's eroding many other things, not, not just democracy. It's uh, about uh, civil rights. Uh, it's about gay rights. Uh, it's about any connections uh, between Jews and non-Jews. It's about defining who are Jews. Uh, these are people who are very, very extreme and are trying to change the face of Jewish-Israeli society. Hello, Omar. How are you? Hi. I'm good, considering the circumstances. Indeed. Uh, thank you uh, for coming on the show. Let me introduce us. I am Glenn Lowry. Uh, I'm the Merton Stoltz Professor of the Social Sciences at Brown University and John Paulson Senior Fellow at the Manhattan Institute. I want you to know that the Manhattan Institute sponsors the Glenn Show, for which I'm grateful. Um, and I'm joined today by Omar Bartov, who is the Samuel Pissar Professor of Holocaust and Genocide Studies in the Department of History at Brown University. He's my colleague. I have known his acquaintance for uh, many years here at Brown, uh, but we haven't uh, had a whole lot of conversation with each other. But in any case, Omar has agreed to join me and to talk about the war uh, in Gaza, Israel, and about the uh, moral and political implications of it uh, for us as citizens of the world and for himself as a, as a scholar and historian of genocide studies. So thanks, Omar, again, for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. Listen, uh, I uh, signed a letter of faculty members here at Brown University early in the conflict calling for a ceasefire. Um, I almost want to say out of naive human instinct that what was about to come was going to be horrific. And if there were any way to avert it, then let us, let us take, a, take the opportunity to do so. Um, and in part because I saw that among the signatories was your name, an Israeli-American historian of genocide studies. Uh, who I thought, uh, it, well, you know, he's a pretty serious guy. There must be uh, a pretty good argument about why one would sign this letter. Not that I didn't have my own arguments, but I don't claim to be an expert. But uh, how is it that you come to be uh, in the position that you're in, uh, speaking uh, on behalf of the position, which when I naively stated, people say, uh, you're a naif, you're a useful idiot. Uh, don't you know that... Uh, uh, Hamas has broken ceasefires in the past, uh, et cetera. And you know all these arguments. Um, I'm, I'm wondering how you countered them. Uh, well, you know, this is a good question, and uh, there's no simple answers to this. Uh, and I would say just uh, up front that the demand for a ceasefire, while I obviously support it and I signed that petition, is uh, to me just a, a very little part of what is really needed because we've had many ceasefires before and the main issue is not only to cease fire but to find a way of avoiding the fire resuming over and over again and each time the fighting resumes the number of casualties rises. Uh, this conflict has become increasingly destructive over the years. So. That's as a, as a general point, I would say. Uh, how do I counter these arguments? These arguments are, are not really, I'd say, um, concerned with the roots of the entire conflict. Uh, the Hamas attack on October 7th was, was a heinous attack. Uh, it included killing of children, women, elderly people, handicapped people. It included rapes. There is nothing uh, that one could say to condone it, but one has to understand the context within which it happened and what is it part of. So is it simply that Hamas is a murderous organization or as it's presented now in Israel as a Nazi organization, or is it the product of something larger than that? And if you look at the context, I think you can say that uh, since 1948, uh, Israel has had a conflict with the Palestinian population uh, that is in large part displaced during the War of 1948 and has not 
uh, shown willingness to find a compromise with various political manifestations of uh, the Palestinian population, whether it was the, the PLO and Fatah or later on the, the arrival on the scene of Hamas, which in many ways was initially actually encouraged by Israel. We can get into that if you like. So uh, the, the conditions that we have on the ground uh, have to do with the fact that there is a land between the Jordan and the sea, as now people like uh, saying, and in that land live now 7 million Jews and 7 million Palestinians. And the Jews have democracy and have rights, although their own government has tried to erode their democracy, uh, the democracy that the Jews have. Uh, And the Palestinians, 2 million of them are Israeli citizens with uh, hypothetically the same rights, but in practice not the same rights. So they're second-class citizens. In the West Bank, Israel rules over 3 million Palestinians who have literally no rights and are under Israeli military rule, and the Israeli military can come in to their homes and do whatever it likes. And 2.2 or 2.3 million Palestinians in Gaza who have been for the last 16 years under Hamas rule, but also under siege by Israel, uh, living in horrendous conditions even before this war began. Uh, and for many, many years, certainly under the numerous Netanyahu administrations, Israel has sought to sweep this whole issue under the carpet, to manage the conflict, and meanwhile to settle the West Bank, to make life increasingly unbearable for the population there, with the hope that they would either leave or that there would be an opportunity somehow to remove them And there is right now, as we speak, increasing uh, noise from Israeli uh, cabinet ministers and members of Knesset uh, talking about uh, encouraging the migration of Palestinians from Gaza, moving them elsewhere so as to solve the problem by ethnically cleansing their territory. Obviously, they don't use that term, but that's what they are talking about. And some have actually talked about uh, Gaza being the Nakba of 2023, the Nakba being the Arabic name for the expulsion of 1948. So that's the larger context of that. And if we don't keep that in mind, then, and and we're talking only about the, the immediate events, then we will find no way of resolving this and we can only anticipate uh, the violence continuing, and as I said, growing from one cycle to another. Omer, what do you say to the predictable retort? The Palestinians have only themselves to blame for the fact that this problem has festered. There have been on more than one occasion opportunities to resolve in the direction under Oslo Accords and so forth, meetings at the White House, Camp David and so forth. Uh, and uh, They've been rebuffed at every turn. Uh, the Israelis don't have a negotiating partner. I just finished uh, Benny Morris's one state, two state, and so forth. You know how that argument goes. I won't try to reprise it here. But uh, what, what do you say to that, that uh, the, the uh, impossible situation that you describe is one of the Palestinians' own making, and you put all the moral responsibility on the Israelis to resolve it? Yeah, this is a common argument. And, you know, I, let, me, let me put it that way. Uh, when um, the attack of October 7th occurred, as I wrote someplace, uh, I was shocked, but not surprised. I was shocked because he was, as I said, really horrendous. I was shocked also because the Israeli army was so absolutely incompetent over the, the first hours, many hours and did not respond as it ought to have and was unable to protect its own citizens. But, of course, by the the atrocious nature of the attack, but I was not surprised. And I was not surprised because of what I said before, but also uh, for another reason. Uh, I was reminded on October 7th of October 6th, 50 years earlier, 50 years in a day earlier, which was 
the outbreak of the Yom Kippur War in 1973 when I was a young soldier. And we were then also deeply shocked by that attack, uh, which initially caused uh, very large uh, Israeli casualties. And the war was eventually won, but it was a very difficult win. Now, what, what was the reason for that war and why am I mentioning it? The reason for that war was that President Sadat of Egypt at the time had been putting out peace feelers to Israel uh, in the early 1970s saying, look, if you return the Sinai Peninsula that Israel had captured in 67, uh, then I'm willing to sign a peace treaty, but I want the Sinai Peninsula, all of it, not parts of it, not give it back and you'll have peace with the biggest, most powerful Arab country um, that existed then and that exists now. And Israel said repeatedly, we'd rather keep the Sinai without peace than have peace without the Sinai. After the war, with 3,000 Israeli soldiers killed and many more thousands of Egyptian and Syrian soldiers killed, Israel said, okay, now you can have it back. And Sadat got it back, and Israel has peace with Egypt, and that has changed the entire, you know, uh, parameters, political parameters in the region. Uh, in the period leading to this attack, October 7th, Israel, as I said, had refused to talk at all about any political compromise with the Palestinians. This has been the policy of Prime Minister Netanyahu for 20 years. We can manage the conflict. This, and, and this is not only the right wing, by the way, in Israel. This, this became the consensus in Israel. We don't need to deal with them because they're too weak. They can't do anything to us. Nobody pays attention to them. Who cares about the Palestinians in Gaza or the West Bank? Look at world politics. Nobody cared about them. Israel was about to sign a, some kind of big deal with Saudi Arabia, brokered by the United States. There would have been connections from India to uh, Israel and so forth. And the Palestinians, well, basically nobody cares to hell with them. Uh, now that this attack came and Israel is waging this uh, rather brutal war uh, in Gaza, suddenly the Palestinian issue has come back. So what am I saying? I'm saying that Israel, unfortunately, uh, yes, it's true, the Palestinians have missed many opportunities. Uh, but Israel in general, if you look at its policies from uh, before the end of the British mandate, throughout its life, has only agreed to compromise under pressure when it did not uh, uh, enjoy what I've called the euphoria of power. As long as it feels that he doesn't need to negotiate, then what do you negotiate over? You negotiate over land. Israel has not been willing to give an inch of land without pressure. Uh, it's unfortunate, uh, and, and it's not only the state of Israel, there are many other countries that are in this kind of mode, uh, political mode. But in the case of Israel, it has only come under pressure. Now, if you talk specifically about such cases as the Oslo Accords, we have to remember and that's important in the present context. Uh, in 1995, and I remember it personally very well, uh, Prime Minister Rabin was assassinated. He was assassinated by a Jewish extremist. This Jewish extremist was just one uh, person, of course, but he was incited among with many others. And who was doing the major incitement at that time? Who actually had the blood on his hands? It was Prime Minister, then not not then Prime Minister Netanyahu, but Netanyahu, who soon thereafter became Prime Minister and was inciting against any peace, any agreement, um, um, depicting uh, in various propaganda posters, depicting Rabin, who was a general already from 1948 and a highly respected, rather conservative uh, Labour Party member, uh, depicting him as a Nazi officer, using all the imagery that triggers uh, the Israeli public, and eventually somebody showed up and shot him. Uh, so there has always been very powerful pressure within Israel, uh, from not only from the right wing, but also from the traditional Labour Party, against any 
compromise as long as Ezra didn't have to make it. Uh, and the Oslo Accords died in large part because the people who supported it, and mostly the person who had the greatest credibility, uh, Rabin, the, the general, the, the hero of 1948, the hero of 1967, uh, the man who said, break their bones during the first intifada, uh, that this man uh, supported peace, had credibility, and he was shot. Uh, now, of course, uh, there has been also a great deal of intransigence uh, on the side of Palestinians. But we have to remember who has the power. We have to remember the enormous asymmetry of power between Israel and the Palestinians, first because of Israel itself, because Israel has uh, a, a powerful army, because it has a powerful economy, and second, because Israel is supported and has been supported for decades now by the United States, which, which is the most powerful country in the world, which gives it diplomatic cover. It has the veto power in the Security Council, it, uh, and it gives it economic help, and most importantly, it gives it a huge amount of military hardware uh, right now uh, being of in incredible importance uh, for the Israeli army. The Israeli army would have to slow down significantly if the United States uh, stopped that support or even limited it. Okay, I, I can't conjure up what the Netanyahu camp would say in response to what you've just said. I'm, I'm not in a position to do that. But I can imagine what some of my students, my Jewish students who are Zionist and who are very passionate might say to me, as they have said in office hours in our private conversations. And they talk about, A, the character of Hamas as a uh, pathologically evil uh, historical uh, ev uh, occurrence. It derives in the development and the personality of Hamas. And they talk about the existential fragility of the Jewish state uh, and of the Jewish people. Uh, and um, the things that I think you would have Israel do on behalf of reaching a compromise are risky things for Israel to do. Um, and the character of uh, the charter in Hamas and their genocidal intent and all have been made very clear. So, um, uh, I feel personally sitting here in the comfort of Providence, Rhode Island, with the security of my person and property without question, loathe to tell people who are on the brink of disaster that they oughtn't to act in the way they see fit to defend themselves. And again, I invite you to, to respond to that. Well, you know, I mean, the, the, you know, this is a big question, right? So we, we can break it down to, to uh, various elements. Hamas itself, uh, as I've said before, uh, Hamas is not an organization that um, I would support. It is an organization that indeed in, um, in um, 1987 issued its, uh, its uh, original charter uh, which is a loathsome uh, document. I actually wrote about it already 20 years ago. Uh, it borrows all kind of text from the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. It has really anti-Semitic aspects to it. And uh, most importantly, uh, it calls for the establishment of an Islamic state in Palestine. Uh, and that Islamic state would obviously have no room or only very little room for any Jews there. So in in, in a sense, it talks about the destruction of the state of Israel. Uh, we can ask, where does Hamas come from and how was that creature created? And again, I can go uh, back to where, where this is coming from and how Hamas, which was originally an organization uh, that um, was supported by Palestinians in Gaza because it was much less corrupt than the PLO and, and Fatah, and because it provided social services to the people there, provided schools and so forth. Uh, and that was the reason that people thought, okay, we, we have some people who care for our needs. It became very extreme. And I don't think it's a negotiating partner. I would, um, uh, I think not only I, but most uh, Arab regimes in the region 
uh, would be happy to see Hamas disappear. Uh, you, you have to remember that Hamas is a product of the, of the Muslim Brothers, uh, and, and they were created in the 1920s in Egypt, uh, and that organization is uh, constantly being um, 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 persecuted by the current Egyptian government. So that's about Hamas. Now, we have to ask what's going on on the other side, too. That is, does Israel have some kind of responsibility for the situation that it finds itself in? And now, this is an interesting question, because the people who are now in government with Netanyahu, um, people like Ben Gvir uh, and Smotrich, uh, who have a great deal of power in the government. In fact, uh, Netanyahu can't do anything right now if they don't agree to it, because if they leave his coalition, the coalition uh, will collapse uh, and he may end up in jail uh, because he's under indictment uh, for, for uh, very severe um, corruption. What do those people want? Now, if you look at what they want, uh, they are a mirror image of Hamas. And that's something that people don't like talking about. These people, the, re- the, the type of religious uh, Zionism that they represent, this is not about all religious Zionists, of course, but the kind of people that they represent, the settler movement there, the roots, Ben Gvir's roots in Kahana, who was declared as a racist, a fascist by the Israeli Supreme Court, uh, and, and his admiration for Kahana. What they want is to create a halachic, that is a religious uh, Jewish state in all of historic Palestine and to have as few Palestinians there as possible. And they are talking right now as we speak about ethnic ethnic cleansing of the Gaza Strip and they are actively operating right now in the West Bank, where since October 7th, well over 300 Palestinians have been killed uh, in trying to persuade the population that it might be safer for them to move to the other side of the Jordan. They want that. Now, does all the Israeli public support it? No, of course not. Do all the Palestinians support Hamas? I don't think so. Uh, but these are mirror images of each other. And how have they come into being? Why are they there? You have to remember that uh, originally uh, the PLO was Marxist. Uh, if you remember the, 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 the images um, looking like uh, Che Guevara, you know, the, the original fighters, Arafat, when he was young, all those guys, they were educated... Uh, many of them in Eastern Europe, in Russia, in Poland, they were funded by the Soviet Union. Uh, the change came in the 1980s. The, the change comes as Israel deepens its occupation and becomes increasingly intransigent about any kind of peace deal of using what at the time was said, using territories for peace that is returning the territories of 1967 for a peace deal with the Arab states, those territories were where Palestinian refugees were living, who were refugees of 1948. Uh, the same, at the same time, what is happening in Israel is the creation of a new movement in Israel, which is religious, which is a settler movement, fundamentalist, messianic. They don't believe in democracy because they're waiting for the Messiah. Uh, Extremely um, um, violent. And those are the people who now, just a year ago, moved into the government. And so this situation has bred, I would say, extremism on both sides. And it's those extremists who are leading both their countries to a dead end or both their peoples, because the Palestinians don't, don't really have a state. Uh, and we, we sort of have to understand that the, at, the, at the core of this, uh, 
if you go back to before October 7th, what the Netanyahu government was trying to do since February 2023 was to erode the power of the legislature, of the, of the, the judiciary, of the yeah. court. And the cause for that, the cause for, for that so-called judicial overhaul, which was really an attempt at the judicial coup, which just yesterday the Israeli Supreme Court uh, uh, ruled on, uh, not in favor of the, of the Netanyahu government. What it was about, it was about the occupation. It was about removing the last sort of um, um, uh, uh, bastion of legality uh, to annexing the West Bank. Uh, and so what, what we see here is not only that Hamas took over a large part of the, of the Palestinian population, but that in Israel, the takeover by these types of fundamentalist settler movement is eroding democracy in Israel. It's eroding many other things, not, not just democracy. It's uh, about uh, civil rights. Uh, it's about gay rights. Uh, it's about any connections uh, between Jews and non-Jews. It's about defining who are Jews. Uh, these are people who are very, very extreme and are trying to change the face of Jewish Israeli society. And Omar, so we have them reflecting each other. This is what I'm trying to say. Understood. And excuse me for interrupting, but I, I just have to ask because Israel is a democracy. I don't know how it is that the tail is wagging the dog. Is it really the tail? Are these really extremists in the sense of being a numerical, small, tiny population? Or do they not give voice to something that resonates more? deeply in the psyche of the of polity. Uh, otherwise, uh, they wouldn't have the power that they have. What, what, what's wrong with what I just said? So in part, they do. In part, they do. Uh, and I would say that uh, that, too, is a reflection of a sort of ongoing process. You can follow Israeli politics and you will see what happened in the year 2000. The year 2000 is the outbreak of the Second Intifada, of the Al-Aqsa Intifada, in which close to, I think, a thousand Israeli citizens were killed in suicide bombings. Uh, eventually, the Sharon government started building the, the separation wall. Uh, uh, that uh, created a major shift in Israeli politics. People who had supported the Oslo Accords and believed in some kind of compromise, uh, decided the Palestinians, you can't deal with them, they want to kill us. And mind you, most of these attacks uh, were orchestrated by Hamas. This is when Hamas becomes really radical. Uh, and so you can see a shift to the right in Israeli politics from the year 2000, and that has remained, and it's possible that what happened in, in October 7th will bring even a bigger shift. Um, to the right. Uh, and that is certainly a reflection of what you see. But one has to add something else to this. And that is that uh, the Israeli parliamentary system is a system of coalitions. And that uh, in the system, relatively small parties can have an enormous amount of influence on government policies because the coalition can depend on something like 10% of the electorate for its survival. If you add to that the fact that Netanyahu, who until the last cabinet, always liked to keep some more moderate members of, um, or representatives of some more moderate parties in his coalition so that he could balance it, this time went for what is called in Israel a right-right government all right government. The people there are all to his right, right? Uh, and he's doing it for a very simple reason. He's doing it because he's corrupt through and through, and he's afraid that if he loses his coalition, he could go to jail. He does not want to give us power. He actually said it just in a press conference a couple of days ago, uh, when he was asked, does he take any responsibility for what happened on October 7th? It was the biggest catastrophe in Israeli history since 1948. Uh, and he has refused to take any responsibility. He has refused to say that he would ever resign. He has even refused to say that there might be elections before 
the next elections are due. And so he went with these people simply because these were the only people who would go with him. No one else wanted to be in coalition with Netanyahu, who proved himself to be a dirty player, somebody you can never trust. So not Gantz, who is a very, you know, centrist uh, uh, person. No one agreed to be in coalition with him, and he had to go with this extreme right, which represents maybe 10 or 15% of the population. But 60 seats in the Knesset? Yes, of is course. It, that's what you well, need for a majority, right? Yes, but, but, but most of the people in that coalition are not uh, these extreme writers. Uh, in, in, over a third of the, the MKs who support it are from his party, from the Likud party. And the Likud party has all kinds of people. It's, uh, it's okay. also moved to the right. It has all kinds of people. And then he has the ultra-Orthodox, and he has Shas. And Shas is, uh, is the Mizrahi Orthodox party. Uh, and to them, instead of adding another party from the center, because the parties of the center would not go with him anymore because he lied to them in the previous cabinet. He, he, he promised rotation uh, as a prime minister with Gantz. And once the time for the rotation came, he said, no, I won't do it. I'm the prime minister. Forget it. I'm not leaving. And that was it. Uh, so obviously Gantz will never go with him again. Uh, so instead he needed someone and he took in people that no political leader would have ever taken these people. Look, I mean, we we have to understand they are Jewish supremacists. They are Jewish supremacists. These people are true racist, and they are now in positions of real power. The, the minister of the police and interior order, that's Ben Gvir. He has huge impact, and the minister of finance was also a minister. They invented something: a minister within the Ministry of Defense. That's Smotrich. They have enormous power in the country, and they represent the real extreme right. That's, that's, that's um, an extraordinary moment in Israeli society, and, and everybody was warning about it. And they were warning during all the protests against the, the judicial overhaul that Israel was facing external danger because all its enemies, and Hamas certainly counts as one, as does uh, Hezbollah, uh, could see that the country is being torn apart, that reservists were saying, we will not um, uh, serve because we don't want to erode democracy, our democracy, never mind the Palestinians who never had it, but our own Jewish democracy. They are taking it away from us. And he was not listening. And then October 7th happened. And still he's taking no responsibility for it. This is, this is extraordinary. Uh, and it's not getting enough sort of attention. The fact that the man in charge of this is running a government that is both corrupt and incompetent. It was incompetent before, and its response to the war has been terrible. Most of the help for tens of thousands of displaced Israeli citizens who have had to leave their settlements, their, their towns and villages in the north because of Hezbollah attacks, and in the South, because of the war in Gaza, are getting no help from the government. They're getting that help from volunteers who are the same people who were protesting against the government before October 7th. Uh, and the government is merely providing more and more funds to religious institutions, to yeshivot, because its own coalition partners are forcing it to do it, and Netanyahu has to do it, otherwise he will lose his coalition and, and as I said, face jail time. I want to talk a little bit about the war. Uh, you had a piece in the New York Times, what I believe uh, as a historian of genocide, uh, that I thought was really quite extraordinary. And you, you say, if I recall correctly, that you don't think the evidence supports yet the conclusion that the IDF are perpetrating genocide against the Palestinians in Gaza. But, and I quote you, there's still time to stop Israel from letting its actions become a genocide. Your piece, in effect, is a warning against the likely, the possibility in any case, that Israel could find itself with great historical irony in the position of perpetrating genocide in Gaza. Now that's the kind of talk that Hamas sympathizing 
uh, anti-Zionist, anti-Semites would be inclined to engage in. And yet here I find you, a professor of uh, Holocaust and genocide studies, an Israeli American, calling that uh, to our attention. Why? Well, look. I mean, I'm 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 looking at uh, what's happening on the ground. Uh, whether what I say um, uh, um, it can be used by uh, the wrong elements uh, doesn't make uh, m- my understanding of what's happening on the ground um, more or less accurate. Um, so yes, I mean, there are people uh, who will say. Um, the Gaza genocide, we have to, uh, this shows that we have to do away with the state of Israel, that it's, and so forth. I'm, I'm not there. I'm an Israeli. I'm an Israeli citizen. I grew up in Israel. Uh, my best friends live in Israel. I have family in Israel. In fact, my, my family was directly affected by what happened in the, in the Hamas attack. Uh, and I care a great deal about that country. I'm, I'm very critical of its policies, but I care about that country. Uh, so I'm not on the side, and, and I'm not an anti-Zionist. I, I think that the Jews have a right of self-determination, and the state of Israel was an expression of that right of self-determination. But that does not mean, uh, even if um, um, you were attacked and a massacre was perpetrated on your population, it does not give you a right to perpetrate a massacre in return. Uh, massacres don't justify massacres. And, and, uh, and, and the kind of rhetoric, first of all, that came out of Israel right at the beginning, uh, and that's part of what I was writing in, the, in, in that op-ed, w- had a, a powerful genocidal echoes. I mean, uh, political leaders, military leaders, ministers, uh, uh, even the president of the state, who, who, who is supposed to be much more moderate, the Herzog, were using language uh, that had genocidal echoes. They, um, um, Netanyahu spoke about Amalek. Remember what Amalek did to you. And, and most Israeli citizens uh, know that what you do to Amalek, according to the Bible, is you kill them all, men, women, children, and infants. Uh, their cattle, their sheep, you, you have to erase them entirely. That is the kind of, or, or you talk about them as human animals, uh, which is a term that is, was used profusely uh, after the attack without necessarily making a distinction between Hamas and the population of Gaza. And now speaking of them as Nazis, which triggers all this sort of, you know, collective memories of the Israeli population. So what is actually happening on the ground? Look, I mean, uh, I, I warned at the time, uh, and that was relatively early on, uh, that this could become genocide. Uh, I'm, I'm still, to, to this day, I'm reluctant to say uh, that Israeli policies in Gaza uh, constitute genocide. Uh, but since I wrote that, the number of civilians killed, the estimated number of civilians killed, or of the overall number of people killed in Gaza has gone up to close to 22,000. The estimates that there may be another 6,000 buried under the debris uh, that have not been dug out. And the Israeli army itself said that and patted itself on the back said that uh, it's very good in this urban warfare because it kills only two civilians per militant. So if you calculate what that means, they're talking about having killed about 15,000 civilians, most of whom are women and children. Half of the population of Gaza are children are under the age of 18. Uh, So first of all, we just have to think about the numbers. The numbers are extraordinary, right? I mean, this is, if you think about it through the prism of uh, war crimes, uh, it would appear that this disproportionate uh, number of civilian losses is an indication of indiscriminate uh, bombing, um, um, use of artillery, airplanes, tanks, bulldozers. 
uh, that has caused this uh, high number of civilian uh, casualties. But what is the actual policy of Israel? What is Israel actually doing in Gaza? So I would say that's where we are approaching a moment in which, and as you know, it's been referred now to the International uh, Court of Justice, to the World Court by South Africa. That's where we are approaching something that could also be seen as genocidal acts. And I'll, and I'll explain what I mean. The, 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 the tactics of the Israeli army are to first declare to the population in a particular region that for humanitarian reasons, they better leave as quickly as possible because this is going to become an area of operations. So they drop leaflets and so forth. And as of a certain moment, they say, okay, if you haven't left, tough luck. From now on, anyone in that area that we see is a legitimate target. Now, before they move in, because they don't want to have heavy Israeli casualties, naturally, and also because they know that that would delegitimize the war. The Israeli pu public is quite sensitive to high military casualties. These are, you know, uh, their, their, their own sons and daughters. Uh, before they move in with the infantry, they bring in the Air Force, and then they bring in artillery, and then they bring in tanks, and they bring in bulldozers. And they literally do what they warned that they would do. They flatten entire neighborhoods. If you look at footage now from the, from, from the city of Gaza, it's, it's a sea of debris. It's been entirely flattened. So while they're doing that, obviously there's still civilians who stay there. They may be sick, they may be old, they, they, they may not want to leave. Uh, it's their homes. People don't like leaving their homes and becoming refugees. So a lot of people get killed in the process, but the most of them leave. And where are they leaving? They're leaving to the south. And as the Israeli army moves further south, more and more people become congested in smaller and smaller areas. And that's the situation right now. You have now 2 million, 2.2 million people uh, living in, 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 in a small part in the southwestern part of the Gaza Strip. That's where they are all now congested. In fact, 1.8 million, or about 85% of the population, have been displaced. And they're in an area where there is um, not enough infrastructure, uh, not enough aid can come in, um, and we can go into that. There's all kind of calorie calculations that the Israelis came up with already years ago. Uh, so people have no clean water, no sanitation, not enough food. They're highly congested. It's, it's been raining there. Uh, there is a serious threat of epidemics. So what happens now? What happens to them? And that's the question. Will they be allowed back? Can they go back to where they live? Now, much of that has been destroyed, right? Can they go back? Well, what are they going to go back to? Does the Israeli army want them to go back? Well, if they go back, then there may be Hamas people among them, and we'll have the whole thing all over again. So what do we do? And so, so now you have people coming up with another humanitarian solution. One was to move them from the area of operations under the guise of humanitarianism. Now there's another humanitarian solution. Why don't they leave the area? The Sinai is a very big peninsula. There's hardly anybody living there. Why don't they go there? Now it happens to belong to Egypt, and Egypt doesn't want them to go there, and there's no place for them to live in it, but they won't be in Gaza. Or maybe some countries, such as Canada, for instance, could take in a few tens of thousands of people from Gaza. It would be much better for them. Uh, who wants to live in Gaza? Canada is a nice country, and it has a good humanitarian heart. Maybe it'll take them in. And in any case, they're refugees. They're, or they're refugees and the descendants of refugees from 1948. So they're already refugees. And then what do we do with Gaza? Well, having flattened it, then we rebuild it, 
and we bring back the settlers who had to vacate it in 2005, something that the settlers who are now in government have never, ever accepted. And it becomes now a fertile, happy, green area of Jewish settlements, and the issue has been resolved. I'm sorry to interrupt, Omar, but I can't help but notice the sarcasm in your uh, description. This you think is a real political agenda? You you think this is a... Yes, it is. It is a political agenda. I've I've been listening. I, I I spend much more time than is good for me listening to the Israeli media, to TV, to radio, reading um, the publications. Yes, this is coming up right now. Now, the reason I say all of this is not that I think it's doable. I don't think they'll manage to do it. But what does it mean in terms of international law? This is not humanitarian action. This is ethnic cleansing. It's under the guise of humanitarian action. But what you're actually doing, you are removing a group that is defined ethnically, religiously. Uh, You're removing it from its area of habitation because you want to settle your group there. That is ethnic cleansing. Now, ethnic cleansing is not well defined in international law, so it, it would appear as forcible displacement but it's the same thing. And that comes under both crimes against humanity and genocide. That is that you are, if you continue with this policy, what you're trying to do is to destroy a group as such. You have declared your intention to do it, and now you're actually doing it. Uh, Now that can be reversed. It can be reversed if it's stopped. It can be reversed if there is actually an international initiative to bring the population back, to rebuild those areas. And all of that has to be done under an international agreement to find a resolution, not just the ceasefire, as I said at the beginning, but to find a political resolution to this conflict. That can't be done with Hamas, I completely agree. And it can't be done with the Netanyahu government. But it can be done. It can be done that people will understand that it, it's, you, you can never destroy Hamas as such. You can remove them. Uh, but if, if you want to resolve this conflict between those millions of people in that land, uh, you either kill one group entirely, you do what these radicals now, and these are ministers, I mean, they are speaking on TV. Uh, they're, they're, this is not hidden. They are, they're proclaiming their agenda. Uh, you either actually do ethnic cleansing, which can culminate in genocide, or you find a political resolution. They do not want a political resolution. Netanyahu has refused to talk about the day after. He will not talk about it because that will topple his government. But in fact, that's where they're heading. And therefore, okay. I think that we are still on the verge of what could be defined as genocide, and the world court may rule one way or another. I I don't know what they will decide. I am thinking about those students of mine that I mentioned previously, uh, American Jewish Zionist students. One of them, I'm not going to name her, is in Israel now. She sends back a post reporting on her interviews with IDF uh, soldiers who are serving She says they don't want what you say the right-wing government wants. She says they're just kids who are fighting to save their families and their homeland. Uh, She points out that, as I'm sure you'll be familiar with, the Hamas use their civilian population as shields against the Israeli military. They uh, infiltrate and uh, uh, found their uh, armaments and their command and control and so forth in sensitive areas. Uh, she says the uh, soldiers are instructed not to shoot at civilians, uh, though they do find weapons in civilian homes and things of this kind. Um, and uh, th- this is a necessity uh, th- that is being uh, carried out, not a, not a desired policy of conquest. And uh, how, how, would you, how would you answer, this is the most moral army in the history of military operations and things of this kind. 
uh, th those leaflets are in fact dropped, which shows, uh, so this argument goes, if Israel had genocidal intentions, it would be perfectly easy for them to carry them out directly and forthrightly. Uh, but uh, they want to avoid that at all costs, et cetera, et cetera. Well, look, I, I know the student that you uh, referring to, uh, and uh, she was in one of my classes too, or two of them. And, um, and I do actually have uh, students such as yours who come to my classes, who uh, uh, nice Jewish kids who uh, went to, um, um, you know, Jewish Sunday school and got a particular version of the history of Israel um, and who was honest and, um, and they come to my class and, um, I, I think many of them by the end of the semester, uh, have learned other things. And as I say, I'm, I'm not an anti-Zionist. I'm, I very much believe in the right of Israel to exist and in the right of Jewish self-determination. I happen to think that the Palestinians also have a right of self-determination and that these rights have to be reconciled with each other. Uh, so uh, I can understand the sentiment and I can understand the disillusionment. I too went through a process of disillusionment. Uh, it's painful, but it's better than to um, not know the truth. As for um, the conduct of uh, Israeli troops, specifically in Gaza, look, I mean, the Israeli army reflects uh, the Israeli population. It's not like the U.S. Army. Uh, now, it's changed somewhat, even in Israel. Uh, so not everybody serves in the army. Uh, if you look at the rules of engagement, and if you look at Israeli army policies over the last 20 years, um, someone was actually just writing about it the other day, uh, you will realize that Israel is not only not the most moral army in the world, but its own rules of engagement, its own, own policies show it to be one of the least moral of the Western armies, simply by rules of engagement. And, and many of these rules of engagement were waived uh, on the day of the Israeli attack on Gaza. And we know about it because the Minister of Defense said it. He said, we are not following the regular rules. So this was not some sort of secret. He actually said it, and he said it to the troops. Right? I mean, a lot of this rhetoric also acts as incitement, of course. However, we then think about it uh, through the prism of uh, international law. So this was said. And we have a very good example. It's a, it's a very tragic example, uh, but it's a good example. The three hostages, three Israeli hostages, three young men, two Jewish and one Bedouin, uh, Arab, uh, managed to escape uh, from the uh, kidnappers and wrote on various wars with food remnants, uh, three hostages, save us. Uh, and then because one of them was an experienced soldier, he knew what you have to do so as to not be shot by your own troops. He had them all take off their shirts so that they won't be seen as carrying any explosives. Uh, they improvised a white flag. They came out of their hiding in the middle of the day, in the sunlight, so that there won't be any suspicion whatsoever. And they shouted in Hebrew, save us. We are hostages. We're Israeli. And they were shot. And the reason they were shot is what I said before, that the rules of engagement now are that once you have told the population to leave and the deadline is over, anybody who moves is a dead person. You don't take any chances whatsoever. Now, I can understand the soldiers there. I was a soldier myself. They are tired. They're scared. They've taken losses. Um, and they see some people coming at them. And before they think twice, they shoot them. But it tells you what the rules of engagement are. There are no rules of engagement. You shoot everybody, whoever you see there. Now, that's 
a second important element, and there have been many reports on that, and I'm sure that, that your students uh, will have seen quite a few of them too. Because the Israeli army represents the population, and because there has been a major effort by the settler movement to move into the military and to rise up through the ranks, now numerous soldiers serving in Gaza, reservists and regular troops, as well as commanders, company commanders, battalion commanders, brigade commanders, come from that group. And there have been many reports showing that those people, when they take over a place, um, you, you can see these photographs, they spread out uh, posters saying, we have come back to, us, to Gaza. We are coming back to the settlements. We are back home. We are going to stay here. Uh, they sing songs along these lines and so forth. Uh, and so what you have, because the army reflects the population and because the population now uh, has been infected by these kinds of sentiments, that is part of what the IDF is involved in as well. I'm not saying that the top brass is supporting it, but the top brass has a problem with it. The, by the way, the chief of staff himself is a yeshiva graduate. He's, he's not with those people, but he comes from a similar background. Uh, there has been an infiltration into the military of these elements, and they're reflected also in the conduct of part, some of the troops who are on the ground. Uh, and it's very hard for uh, uh, military commanders on the ground, who may not share their soldier sentiments, uh, to control that. Uh, they want to keep their soldiers' morale high. They are filled, and, and that's a whole other issue, they're filled with a, with a thirst for revenge, which is being um, projected from the top, that we have to take revenge, which is not a military policy. Revenge is never a good military policy. You don't get good results. Uh, but it's very hard then to stop these soldiers. And the last thing I'll say, just uh, the, the sad thing about all this is, and, you know, I started off, um, not only was I a soldier and an officer, I also, the early history that I wrote was military history. I, I, I spent many years studying military history. Uh, I also worked uh, for investigating various war games done by the German army, by the Israeli army, so I have a little bit of knowledge in this. The Israeli military campaign in Gaza is a fiasco. It's the second fiasco. The first was October 7th, and the second is what the Israeli army has done since the beginning of operations in Gaza. You have to think that an army that um, recruited 350,000 soldiers that has the best aircraft in the world, the best tanks in the world, the best artillery in the world, the best intelligence in the world, the electronics in the world, went to Gaza and for 10 weeks, it's been fighting somewhere between 20 and 40,000 lightly armed guerrillas, and they're still fighting. They have not released the hostages. The only hostages that were released were released during a ceasefire or pausing the fighting. None other, all the 129 uh, left over, if they're still alive, have not been released, which was one goal, a declared goal of the operation. The second goal was to destroy Hamas as a military organization. It's not been destroyed. Uh, and it's been now months of fighting. That is, the, what they've managed to do is to flatten Gaza, kill large numbers of civilians, and possibly, they're talking about six, seven, eight thousand militants. Maybe they they actually don't know for sure. How how would they know? But let's say it's correct. Uh, that is maybe you know twenty percent of the fighting force of Hamas. So the, it's a failure, and it's a failure because the, at the very beginning, the thinking about it was completely wrong. The thinking about was was driven by a thirst for revenge and destruction rather than actual effective results. And now Israel is, as I said, on the verge of a 
total humanitarian disaster that can eventuate in genocide that could have been entirely avoided. Uh, let me ask you this. We're, we're getting near the end, but I just wonder how you perceive the American uh, political discourse on, on this question. Uh, you've made a very powerful case. Uh, and yet I don't hear that case being made with anything like a kind of coherence and forcefulness uh, from the uh, leaders of our own uh, political communities here. Why do you think that is? It's terrible. I, to- I totally agree with you. It, 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 it's extremely frustrating. Uh, I think, you know, I think that, the, that Biden himself, President Biden himself, uh, the, the time that he expressed himself has the right thing in mind. He, he's, he's talking about the right thing. He's talking about the, he agrees that Hamas has to be removed. And he says there has to be a day after that day after has to be a political negotiation over the creation of two states. And all of this is completely correct, but it's just words. And they're not expressed very coherently, consistently, and they are not followed up by actions. And as anybody coming from the Middle East, whether they're Palestinian or Israeli, will tell you, people there understand only the language of power. If you say, I'd like you to do something, there's no way that they will do it. If you say, you have to do it, otherwise there will be a price, then they might think twice. And the U.S. has not done that. So why is it happening? Look, I mean, there are internal political reasons, obviously, for the uh, Democratic Party. I, I don't have to tell you about that. You know that much better than I do. Uh, I think, and I, I hope maybe it's happening, but I don't know that it is, that the White House, for its own sake, even for its uh, domestic uh, interests, has to put together a think tank, a group that will come up quickly with a plan for the day after, not wait for Netanyahu to do it, he'll never do it, with a clear plan for the day after and get the international community behind it, get anyone they can behind it. In Israel, among the Palestinians, there is a potential Palestinian leadership, but it's in Israeli jails. Um, Get the Germans, get the French, get the British behind a plan. Uh, Present that plan not as a suggestion, but as something that Israel either and the Palestinian leadership who want that, we know that the PA actually wants it. They just have no power whatsoever, the Palestinian Authority. Present the Israeli government with that plan and say, you take it or leave it. If you leave it, then you're on your own then you have to deal with it. But our plan is for your own good. Your economy will collapse. The, the Israeli economy is, is in the tank. We are offering now an international commitment to rebuild Gaza, to create a new political leadership for Palestinians, to restore um, what is being destroyed, to do away with the extremists. But you have to join it. If you jo- don't join it, you'll have to produce your own tank shells, which Israel has not the capacity to do. Uh, so I, I think it has to be done. It is not being done. I don't know exactly why. Um, I think there's a kind of naivete about uh, Israel uh, in the White House, I'm afraid. I think that there are pressures from uh, powerful um, um, forces in America against putting any pressure on Israel. And I think it's, it's not in the interest of Israel. Um, never mind that it's not in the national interest of the United States. It's not the, in the national interest of Israel. Its current leadership is leading it into a hole. And, and, and we haven't even mentioned the fact that what's happening in, in, in Gaza may any day begin to look like a footnote to the larger regional conflict that can blow up any moment. Hezbollah has 150,000 rockets. They fired maybe 200 of them. Uh, Iranian militias are in Syria, in Iraq. The, the Houthis are now, as you know, um, blocking the Red Sea. This can blow up if it's not stopped. 
And it has to be stopped with a clear, well-articulated plan. And that is, we have not seen that yet. I, I can hear uh, some of my Zionist friends, these are not students, these are people who run hedge funds, saying, that's pie in the sky, Pollyanna, utopian thinking. Uh, the United Nations, which is representative of world opinion, is never, ever, ever going to see things Israel's way. We're not about to subcontract our security and the future of, of our uh, national experiment to uh, supposedly neutral or benevolent third parties, et cetera. And so on both sides, I mean, you can't trust the world community to come to a resolution of this conflict. Um, and we're not going to be dependent upon uh, external forces for our own security. I can hear that kind of argument. I don't know how we get from where we are now to where you would like us to be. <laughs> well, you will notice that I didn't uh, speak about the UN. I spoke about the US. Uh, and uh, Israel has actually contracted its security to the US. Uh, Israel <laughs> is entirely dependent on the US for its security. It's dependent on, on munitions and it's dependent on diplomatic cover. The only thing that protects Israel from sanctions by the UN is the United States. Uh, and it's, it's Israel's doing. Uh, Israel has become a state that depends only on one other country. And it's lucky to have uh, Joe Biden as the president of the United States right now. Uh, that would not last very long. And I think, as you know, public opinion in, in, in the United States, not least in the Democratic Party, and certainly among the younger cohorts, is moving elsewhere. I don't like that. I'm not in favor of that. But it's moving elsewhere because people are not stupid. People can see what Israel has been doing. They would like it to change its policy, but it's not doing that because it has American cover. To put together an international coalition what happened after 73 was that Henry Kissinger, who has a, to say the least, a mixed reputation. <laughs> to say the least. Uh, yes. Uh, Henry <laughs> Kissinger and President Nixon put together a deal which, ma which made for the peace between Israel and Egypt. Uh, that, as I said, the Israelis did not want peace with Egypt, or rather they would have been happy for a peace with Egypt as long as they could keep whatever they had. They would not give back the Sinai. That kind of international coalition, not UN. The UN is good for talking about it, but the coalition itself would be a coalition of those who support Israel. Israel has huge support from Germany, including military support and intelligence support, from France, from Britain, and from the US in particular. Those countries, for their own good, should come together with a plan initiated by the United States. This, I mean, I think that what happened on October 7th was a catastrophe. It, it, it's, 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 it's awful to think about it, but it is also an opportunity. And it's, a, it's, it's an opportunity to change the political paradigm, to stop talking as some of your hedge fund, fund friends say, well, we are the realists. Look where the Israeli realism led them. Look where they are now. It was hubris. They thought that they could get away with anything. And they had, uh, you know, a thousand uh, citizens uh, murdered because of that hubris, because they, the young female soldiers who were sitting across the fence and saying, we can see Hamas uh, preparing for an attack, and the older um, uh, officers, senior officers, or male, of course, in the back, say, yeah, you're exaggerating. Maybe they'll launch a missile or two. They're incapable. They're Arabs. They can't fight. Uh, and those, those women are now either dead or as hostages in Gaza because nobody listened to them because of this bravado. You know, don't, we don't need the UN. We don't need the US. We can deal with everything on our own as long, of course, as we get American missiles, American uh, cover in the UN and so forth. It is time that that bluff has been called. And now you have an opportunity to do something else. And it's not, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to say, uh, the US right now is not using that opportunity. And I pray to God that he would. There are enough people here who can advise the administration better. But maybe they're not 
your hedge fund friends, maybe from some other quarters, though I don't know your friends, of course. So. I'll let that be the last word. <laughs> uh, this has been Glenn Lowry, The Glenn Show. I've been with Omer Bartov, who is the Samuel Pissar Professor of Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Brown University, my colleague. Thank you so much, Omer. Thank you, Glenn, very much. Thank you.